broker competition. It's the standard textbook description of markets and it has several key features. There are lots of competitors, no single competitor has control of the game, every competitor does pretty much the same thing, and there's no cost to entering or leaving the action. We're here at water polo practice to take a close look at pure, also called perfect, competition. But it's not the perfect abs we're talking about. It's something else in the water, chlorine. You see, the classic examples of pure competition are markets for commodities like agricultural goods, foreign exchange, and chemicals like chlorine. So everyone out of the pool and let's review the basics of the purely competitive market for the chemical that purifies water. There are lots of sellers, in chlorine's case, lots of chemical companies. Every supplier's chlorine is pretty much the same standardized homogenous product. It's a chemical element after all. No chlorine maker exerts control over price. For suppliers, price under pure competition is a take it or leave it proposition. It's not all that hard for a supplier to enter the market or exit by closing up shop, mainly because it doesn't take a huge investment to start producing chlorine. And, many economists would add, both buyers and sellers have full and equal, that is, symmetric information about the product they're trading, standard chlorine. Now, we have to admit, even the chlorine market is not an exact example of pure or perfect competition. But that's okay, says University of Texas professor Daniel Hammermesh. I always use the term perfect competition, which I think is a bit more felicitous because it implies something which we never get. But it's an assumption. It's like the frictionless pulley in high school physics. There's no frictionless pulley, okay? Or gravityless this or that. These are assumptions we make in order to understand the world better. And for a lot of problems, they aren't so far wrong. According to economic theory, the future for a purely competitive firm is also something of an abstraction. Its revenue should only be able to cover the explicit costs of production, like paying workers and the rent, and the implicit costs, like the normal return on entrepreneurial time and capital. Thus, any firm can only be expected to earn a so-called normal profit. As we draw it, any supplier in the market is looking at a flat horizontal demand curve at equilibrium. That is, because the firm is such a small player in the market, it can't supply enough to affect total output and therefore can't affect price, up or down. So on the supply and demand graph, at equilibrium, every firm in a perfectly competitive market has to take the equilibrium price as a given. That's why in pure competition, firms are called price takers as opposed to price makers. The price taker takes the prices given, takes it as a fact of life that it cannot influence the price, and simply decides how much to produce. But it does not, by producing more or producing less, try to influence the price. To try to find a reasonable approximation of pure competition in action, we went to Babson College, famous for its annual entrepreneurship competition. A $5,000 first prize goes to the student team with the best business plan for a new company. One plan, a new retail concept for history buffs, the History Shop. The History Shop essentially wants to create the ultimate experience for people interested in American and world history. Products like books, and magazines, prints, videos, DVDs. Another team wants to make a medical device for weight loss. The benefits of this is a faster recovery, fewer complications, and less cost. An example. There's also a cheap new way to produce a chemical called ferrate, which, if it's cheap enough, can be used to purify water. And uh, you have two is when we actually will build our manufacturing facility for that we need $11 million. How, we wondered, would these entrepreneurs try to overcome the limitations of pure competition? How would MBA student Rezwan Sharif convince the judges, who play the role of investors, that he can compete in competitive markets like those for ferrate and chlorine and still deliver what he's promised, more than a normal profit? You know, you have the saying, when something's too good to be true, it usually is. So here's my... <laughs> <laughs> that was my reaction when I first heard about it. I know. Well, it... Having read our economics textbook, we were skeptical, too. 
how would you get profit out of something when, after all, equilibrium says that you're going to wind up having to price it and be a price taker, not a price maker? That's a great question. Um, well, we are looking at an industry where the prices are set. Uh, however, this is a new chemical. And for this chemical, the prices have not been set. What we're like looking to do is actually demonstrate its value. And we, we're going to go with a value price. So if it's more effective than uh, two chemicals that can do the same effect, then obviously we have a greater value. In other words, Sharif wants to change the water purifying market, change the balance intrinsic to perfect competition by shocking the market with new technology. In the business plan, it states that one of your premises is that your cost of producing ferry is much lower than with other companies. In fact, his way of making ferrate is so much cheaper than existing methods, it can now be used to purify water, even compete with chlorine. So to keep the picture simple, for any given quantity of water purifying chemicals, his costs will be lower. Therefore, he can produce more at any given price, a shift of his supply curve to the right. And if he does this before the other competitors in the marketplace, his firm will take away some of their business. Indeed, he thinks he can price enough above his own marginal costs to make an economic profit, enough money to pay back his investors at more than the normal rate of return, and then some. Before I invest in this, um, the, one of the uh, real paradoxes here is that you've got these giants in the chemical business, DuPont, GE, Nalco, and yet you said there's been no breakthrough in chemicals in this, is in this whole arena for the last 50 years. So my question is, why do you think, with all these giants, there's been no breakthrough? Well, what's interesting is it's not a new compound. It's been very difficult to produce until now. The raw materials are iron, potassium hydroxide, and water. Those are generic materials. But the process with which you combine them to create the salt is one that's expensive. And that's, that's, where, that's our problem, intellectual property. Sharif hopes to protect that intellectual property with a patent that would give his firm exclusive right to use the process for years. The GI Dynamics team is also using a patent to get around the strictures of pure competition. It's for a completely new product called the Slender Sleeve, a medical device for losing weight. And then it's going to be very thin, it's going to go down, down your throat, down your, through your stomach, and then be placed firmly into your small intestine. So. It's going to mimic what happens in the gastric bypass. The a patent for the sleeve would mean that instead of many suppliers, there'd be only one, for a while at least, in the part of the weight loss market for the very obese. The patent protects GI dynamics from competition while offering patients the less intrusive method of inserting a sleeve to prevent food absorption than an operation to temporarily staple off and bypass part of the small intestine. Will be cash flow positive, self-sustaining, within 1.5 years of commercialization. Other teams are also building businesses around new concepts that don't yet exist in their markets. What is the critical factor for success and what are the greatest risks? The critical factor for success, I think, would be partly... All of these ventures are would-be examples of imperfect competition. Wanting no competitors, if possible, they supply products which aren't standardized or homogenous, betting they can be price makers. We're just trying to make sure In fact, imperfect competition is the way the business world mostly works, with some exceptions like agriculture, financial markets, and generic chemicals like chlorine. So why use the model of pure or perfect competition at all? Because of its power in explaining the basics of most markets, says Professor Hammermesh. Most industries, it's true, there are slightly different products. Most industries, it's true, it's a bit hard to enter the industry. But it's not very hard to enter the fast food business locally. There are a lot of fast food places. It's not very hard to set up a new, a new shoe store in a local mall. I mean, it can't be. There are 15, 20 shoe stores in every local mall. So when we talk about easy entry into a market, we're not too far wrong. When we talk about homogeneous product in a market, yeah, I mean, my wingtips are different from somebody else's loafers and somebody else's uh, tennis shoes, but they aren't that different. Yes, it's a construct. It's completely artificial. It's a darn good description, however, of most of what goes on out there in the real world. Uh, thank you to everybody here at Babson for welcoming us here today. That, of course, is what the simplifications of economics are all about. 
but don't expect them to explain all of the particulars of the real world, or for that matter, all the reason the winners at Babson won. The, um, we had to make some tough decisions. And the winner is? GI Dynamics, Guido Bookbinder.